Hi, everybody. I'm Carrie Nordland, and I'm the Associate Director of the Master of Public Affairs Program at the Watson Institute at Brown University. And this afternoon, from my home, I'm going to be talking about executive power in the age of Trump. And really, this is a discussion and a talk about the expansion of presidential power. This is often a topic that we're more and more interested in, especially in as President Trump has now been in office for three years. But the goal and the point of this talk is not to make this about a single, a single person or to make this about a particular presidency or about a personality. This is really about the institution of the executive branch and how and we'll just talk about this, how the growth of presidential power has been growing since Reagan. We'll, we'll back up a little bit from that, but really to show the, the whole trajectory of how it is that we've gotten to where we are today in terms of having a branch of government. There are three co-equal branches of government, how we've gotten to one branch of government that is more powerful than the other two branches of, uh, of government. So I start today with a slide of George Washington. And of course, as the first president, he is often the touchstone for a lot of political and campaign speeches. But I think most important to remember about Washington is that when he was asked to be president, he didn't want to be president. He really saw the president as this unwritten blank page. No one was really quite sure what what the president was going to do. If we just think about the way the Constitution was set up, Article 1 is about the legislative branch, which the framers thought would be the most important branch, and Article 2 is about the executive branch. And so the president, presider, president, would be in some ways the follower to the legislative branch. So this obviously looks very different than what we are, than what we see today. But Washington, you know, was a Revolutionary War hero. He wanted to get back to Mount Vernon. This was really what, what he wanted, but he stepped into the role of president because he was asked to, to do that. In a lot of ways, if we were able to time travel in so many different ways, Washington would not recognize the type of muscular presidency, muscular executive branch that we have uh, that we have today. And we look at the constitutional from and we look at the pause. So if we look at presidential powers from a constitutional point of view, there are pretty limited powers. So this is strictly from the Constitution. So if we pull our Constitution off our bookshelves and we look at the roles that the Constitution gives the president that are his and his alone, his meaning the pronoun, because since we haven't elected a woman president, you see the list of these on this particular slide. It's not a really robust you uh, a robust list of powers that the president uh, that the president has. Now, the commander in chief, the second bullet, has become something much more. But at the time, it really was just a ceremonial power that the president uh, would have. And even the State of the Union address, which we come to expect on an annual basis, was really just meant as something that might infrequently happen, as uh, as something that the president might do, you know, on a semi-regular basis, but not and with the fanfare that it now that it now gets. And of course, the last bullet is that the president can call Congress back into session. And this, as you can see, uh, both President Taft and Truman tried this, but Congress uh, decided that they would not actually heed um, the president's call to come back. So again, just shows you the limited scope of presidential powers from a constitutional perspective. Now, these three bullets are the shared constitutional powers that the president has with either the Senate or with the House. Now, this, again, starts to expand some of the presidential powers that the, that the executive branch has. But again, these are shared powers that the, that the executive branch has with the legislative branch. They're not powers that the executive branch has that are his, um, that are his and his alone. So again, setting the, uh, setting the stage for that from a constitutional perspective, very pretty, you know, weak executive branch, an executive branch that is checked by the legislative branch, a le uh, executive branch that is checked by the uh, by the uh, by the Supreme Court and by the judici by the judiciary. So in this way, again, and we're not seeing a president that is expansive or executive power that had expansive powers across the federal bureaucracy, which is what we see right uh, right now. So one of the big questions is that from a constitutional perspective, again, the president's very weak, 
um, presidential scholar Richard Neustadt said in his very influential book that the president was really a clerk. The president was there to sign things, the president was there to move things along, but was the president, as George W. Bush called him, the decider in chief? The president was not. And executive power, again, this is really important to remember, executive power was subordinate to that of legislative power. And again, we just to look at the Constitution and think about how the framework of that was set up just gives us that particular, gives us that particular signal. So if we think about it, if from this perspective that presidential power is left if left undefined, as so much is from the Constitution um, in setting up the federal government, so much was left undefined. Um, another talk on this is, of course, the judicial branch. But does the absence of defined power mean that the president has unlimited power? And I'm going to pause here just for a second and really think about this question, because I think when we start to talk about personalities and individuals, we think, well, so and so did X, and so, but such and such president did Y, and therefore this is. But one of the things to remember is that the presidency is all about precedence. So a very small example is that George Washington um, was president for two terms and then he stepped away from it. And up to FDR, every president serves two terms. And so, so often with the presidency, with the executive branch, because so much is left undefined, everything is on precedence. And this is a really important point because whoever steps into the Oval Office door, walks into the Oval Office door in January 2021, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Joe Biden, whether whoever it is, they are not going to say, oh, let me give back the power that the prior administration had. Barack Obama didn't do this, Bill Clinton didn't do this. In so many different ways, presidents build on the precedents that, that they have. Now, this goes to this point that you see big buildup of executive power really coming out of the war. So if we take a more historical view of this, FDR takes a lot of power. So for example, the budget. So from a constitutional perspective, the budget is, the budgetary process is led by, uh, by the House. During World or during the Depression under Roosevelt, World War II, the president takes the um, the budget office, then called the um, the Bureau of Budget (BOB), and takes it under the wing of the White House, where it becomes the Office of Management and Budget. Now, this is a very simple example, and there's a lot more details to it. But the bottom line is the president rests control of the budget, a huge part of the leg of the legislative branch's responsibility, and says, "Now I'm going to take the lead on this." And as a example, we then see the president using the State of the Union to talk about the budget as if he's the one who is, uh, who should be the one presenting the budget to the, to Congress, when it really is vice versa, right? The, the Congress should be setting their own budget and the president signing that in uh, into law. And so coming out of World War II, we have a great buildup of, pres of, again, of expansive executive power, which really culminates with Nixon and of course with, uh, with Watergate. So after post Watergate, we see um, what Congress says is the best disinfectant is sunlight. And you have a number of sunlight laws that come into the, or executive orders that come into play. So for example, the war powers resolution that the president has to uh, tell Congress uh, about any time that he plans to invade a country. And uh, again, more details to that, but bottom line things. And since then, of course, presidents have essentially ignored all that. So we think about the presidents right after Watergate forward, President Carter, and then we start to see, again, this buildup of presidential power under uh, President Reagan. And this is really where, we, if we pull on that thread a little bit more, we see this with President Trump. And again, the, it, this is not a Republican, this is not a Democrat, this is, this is just about presidential power because presidents can circumvent Congress so easily because they are one entity versus 535 representatives and senators, they can really outmaneuver Congress. And every president comes to some roadblock with Congress and gets really, really frustrated. Truman said, Congress meets, I don't know why. And this is, you know, always pointing the finger at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue to say, what's the holdup? Why are you blocking all of this important legislation? So there's this inherent tension between the executive branch and the legislative branch, but because the president is one person or one entity, he can so often circumvent and outmaneuver the legislative branch and this, of course, is uh, can be 
a good thing if we want efficiency and expediency. Think about post 9-11. This can be a very bad thing if we think about 9-11 um, in terms of civil liberties, in terms of torture, in terms of a whole host of, uh, of other items. So this, this rhetorical question about does the absence of defined power mean the president has unlimited power? Of course, presidents have answered this in different ways. Nixon famously or infamously said, when the president does it, it means it's not illegal. This is a real question. And presidents will point to this opening line of Article 2, the executive power shall be vested in president of the United States. Executive power is supreme power. And so again, thinking about how do we get a president that is so strong or executive branch that is so strong these are a few examples of why it is that we've gotten there we see we see individuals come into office thinking that when a president does it, it means it's not illegal assassinations right president obama under president obama war so many different things that the public allows the president to do. And in a lot of ways, it's because this rests on this notion of that the American public wants a strong president. They want a decider. They want someone who's commanding. They want someone who can make a decision very, very quickly. And in that way, we as the public allow a president to have this expansive power. And the president, meanwhile, is able to point at executive power shall be vested in the president of the United States to cover themselves when it comes to, well, why should we allow this? Well, so it becomes this very circular sort, uh, sort of argument. And in this way, I think this is really important in understanding why it is that we see, again, executive, expansive executive power, because we, the public, allow it, but also the Constitution, from a, from a fairly narrow point of view, also allows it with this opening line of, uh, of Article 2. I think the other important thing to point out, and this is as someone who has studied the presidency for a long time, is to note that it has been long the call of presidential scholars and those who, again, who just study and observe the presidency, that the, that the power that the president has has been has, is too much and that there needs to be a balancing between the other three branches of government that it cannot be a situation where the president is always out in front and so strong and the other two branches are just kind of trailing behind the executive branch and so in a lot of ways the talk that oh the president the executive branch has become has um has become too strong the president has too much power this is a good discussion to be having because it's important that congress actually does more and takes more control of situations whether it's an emergency like we're experiencing right now with the virus whether this in times of war that the president and congress and the judicial branch are co-equal branches. They are not just one, and then the other two are just secondary branches. One of my colleagues, Andrew Rudolevich, has this great book, um, The New Imperial Presidency. Um, and one of the opening um, examples that he gives is right after 9-11, Congress is, de is debating the authorized use of military force. And there are several Congress people who say, we don't know, the president knows more than we do. And that was just one of those instances where they debated more about renaming French fries to Freedom Fries than they did the AUMF, which is still in, which is still enacted today. And so Congress for a long time, and maybe not so, you start to see a little bit now more of Congress really trying to make sure that they are this co-equal branch with the president. But especially after 9-11, they really let the president president, the Bush administration, really take the lead and decide on so many important policies having to do with American foreign policy um, after 9-11. And so this larger discussion, the point that I'm trying to make is that for people to finally say Congress needs to be doing more and Congress needs to be the at least and the judicial branch, a co-equal branch is a really important part of this larger discussion, which I think often gets kind of brushed under the rug because we just kind of there's something happens and then we just kind of go on without thinking about what the implications are of this uh, situation may be on our um, on our institutional uh, institutional branches. Um, so in conclusion, this is not a, um, this is not meant to be an exhaustive um, discussion of the expanded role of the president or of the executive branch, but it brings up these questions about the role of the president in the public policy process. Again, the president is often the leader on this, and we see the other two branches kind of trailing on this. I think that there was, and this may not be 
totally accurate now that the growth of presidential power means the president can do almost anything he wants. Now, of course, I exaggerate here, but the point is, is that until Congress or until the judicial branch decides to curb presidential power, and this is sometimes a question, Elena Kagan, as she went through her judicial um, uh, approval process, was certainly on the side of not curbing executive power, although there has been some debate about this. But what does this mean? Does this allow president in, to, in the words of Nixon, if the president does it, it means it's not illegal. The president controls the process. The president controls the two most important processes, and that is around budget and around, and around war. And so this is a really important uh, avenue that Congress has to try to take some control of these two various processes. And this is my last point about that. There's a little oversight by the other two branches. The judicial branch to, to, uh, to end on their role has had very little appetite to curb again, the powers of the presidency over the course of the last, since 1954, in the case of uh, Youngstown, Ohio, or uh, Youngstown Sheet and Tube um, versus the Truman administration. Since then, I think there's been six cases in which the court, up to now, in which the court has tried to curb the powers of, uh, or at least in specific cases, say the president cannot do this. So in Youngstown Sheet and Tube, it was that the president cannot seize property. Um, in, you, in the famous case, U.S. v. Nixon, the court says Nixon has to turn over the tapes, but then the other, other hand then recognizes executive privilege. And then there's, I think, three or four cases under the Bush administration about torture. So this is not a really big, long list of jurisprudence that we have in which the courts are even saying the president shouldn't be able to do these things. The president's power should be, should be, um, should be uh, limited in some particular way. So if anything, this talk is really um, a sounding bell that the other two branches of our government have to be more involved and have to really provide that check and that balance to the executive branch. Because thus far we see an executive branch that is so strong and so muscular that again, in, in times in which we're living, especially with all of the shutdowns and lockdowns of our of cities and, uh, and states with the virus, the Congress has to play a stronger role in some of, in the decision making around these items so that the precedence is not set, that a president can do this, and therefore the next president will be able to build on those particular powers. Thank you for listening. Um, please reach out. I'm going to, I'll go back to the, uh, my first slide here just to give you my contact information. If you have, it's just my name underscore, uh, my first underscore and my last name at brown.edu if you have any questions. Um, thank you so much for listening and I hope it provides you a little bit of insight into the institution of the, uh, of the executive branch and in the institution of the presidency and was able to at least in some ways step back away from the partisan politics of things and think about just about the expanded power of the executive branch. So thank you again. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye.